Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to present uh, next speaker, Professor Mikhail Belkin from uh, Walter Schottke Institute at the Technical University of uh, Munich. Uh, Mikhail received a PhD degree in physics from uh, University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he worked in Federico Capasso group uh, in uh, Harvard University. Maybe you know uh, Capasso was one of the inventors of the quantum cascade laser, amazing uh, terahertz and far infrared source. After Harvard, uh, Michael joined the University of Texas uh, at Austin. Then he moved to Munich, uh, where he is leading a group at Walter Schottke Institute. Uh, Michael's uh, research interests include uh, mid-infrared and terahertz photonics, optoelectronics, and nonlinear optics. In particular, in 2014 year, together with Andrea Lu, he built a nonlinear mirror that could uh, enable the building of very small optical devices, including laser sources. And uh, Michael's talk uh, is dedicated for nonlinear optical metasurfaces. Its planar structure is made of a large uh, number of sub-wavelength elements with engineering nonlinear optical response. Uh, in presentation, he will share results of developing metasurfaces that display second and third order nonlinear susceptibility values for seven orders of magnitude higher than that of traditional nonlinear materials. In particular, he will present metasurfaces uh, designed for efficient mid infrared second harmonic and indifference frequency generation with controllable phases of nonlinear optical response. Also, we'll talk about metasurfaces designed for saturable absorption and power limiting. So this is the short introduction of uh, contents of this uh, talk. And so, Michael, the floor is yours, please. OK. Uh, works now. All right, thank you very much for, for the introduction. And I uh, would also like to thank Broilis for <laughs> sponsoring me <laughs> here. Um, so um, I, I have uh, moved uh, to the Walter Schottke Institute in uh, 2019. And there we actually do a, a, a scope of uh, research topics. We work on uh, a, a light sources, quantum cascade lasers, uh, uh, mid-infrared uh, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, photonic integration, uh, and these are more applied topics. Uh, and then we also have another line of research on this uh, uh, nonlinear metasurfaces that is more physics oriented. So because this, uh, this open readings is more physics oriented, I decided to focus more on, on this uh, metasurface work. And this is uh, maybe a little further away from applications, but uh, but still has a potential of applications. Um, so uh, when we uh, think about uh, uh, nonlinear optics, and nonlinear optics is used, uh, for example, to, to produce uh, new light colors uh, where you can mix, uh, let's say, uh, uh, photons in the visible range to produce difference frequency generation and, and infrared radiation. Uh, in, in such a way, uh, photons at different frequency, uh, the two input photons, uh, you use nonlinear non crystals. And of course, here in uh, Vilnius, there are a lot of companies uh, on display here, uh, XPLA, X XMA, and uh, light conversion that use nonlinear crystals to produce these tunable light sources. Um, normally, the, the nonlinear effects are weak effects. And when I say nonlinear effects are weak effects, we, we can compare these nonlinear effects with the, with the uh, linear ones by looking at um, the polarization term that is uh, producing the linear effects, and that's the uh, first order in expansion of the polarization of the medium, P, with respect to the applied electric field E. So we know that for linear effects, polarization equals to epsilon naught, chi one, the uh, uh, permittivity of uh, or susceptibility of, of the uh, material times the electric field. And uh, one plus permittivity gives you the um, 
one plus susceptibility gives you the permittivity of the medium, which is, we know, uh, uh, equals to the square root of the refractive index in optics, and we know that uh, refractive index is of the order of one and a half, two, three, so chi one is basically of the order of one in, in linear optics. We also know that uh, for linear optics, it is sufficient to have a sub film of, uh, for example, uh, molecules or a sub film of uh, resonators uh, to essentially completely extinguish the incident light field and maybe re-radiate in case of resonators or scatter it uh, into the free space with maybe new phases uh, to, for example, produce some beam steering or uh, beam focusing. And this is all the basis of uh, the new concept of so-called uh, flat optics, where these linear components are used to shape the beam, and the light scattered by the linear components is used to shape the beam. This idea was uh, pioneered uh, 10, 15 years uh, ago. Uh, Federica Capasso was one of the people who pioneered this idea, but there were also a number of other players. And now these linear optical elements are being um, uh, um, developed uh, to, for example, replace uh, some of the bulk three-dimensional lenses in cell phones and in other components. Um, now, we want to ask a similar question. Can, can, similar, elements, can, can similar elements be built uh, for nonlinear optics? And in nonlinear optics, we know that nonlinear effects, for example, uh, some frequency generation, uh, the polarization for this nonlinear effect, uh, P2, at some frequency generation, is uh, proportional to the nonlinear susceptibility tensor of the medium times the square of the electric field. That's what gives the frequency mixing. And traditional materials have uh, the values of this nonlinear susceptibility of the order of 10 picometers per volt. So for linear optics, this quantity is uh, dimensionless. Uh, and in linear optics, since you have the square of the electric field, the dimensions of this unit is inverse of the field strengths. And these are the typical values that you have in, um, in uh, bulk materials that are available by nature. So in order for you to, to build a, a similar uh, concept, flat nonlinear optics, that is uh, nonlinear optics uh, which produces significant amounts, some different frequency generation from atomically flat layers, you need the nonlinear polarization, uh, P2, to be comparable in strength to the linear polarization components. Because we know in linear optics it works, so nonlinear optics has to be of the same order. Now, you could look at the values of chi2 and, and realize that in order for this nonlinear effects to be comparable to the linear effects, you need the electric field strengths such that the product of this times the electric field gives you uh, uh, something of the order of one. Then this term is comparable to that term. And that gives you the light intensities in the range of one picowatt per square centimeters, which is clearly very high levels of intensity, only available with pulse lasers, and the material damage uh, threshold is uh, well below these levels. In fact, this uh, strength, the electric field strength for these intensities is comparable to the atomic fields, and of course, uh, materials cannot sustain this, this type of intensities. Now, what would flat optics give us, uh, flat nonlinear optics give us? So, first of all, uh, when, when people use, maybe I'll go back for a second, when people use uh, uh, nonlinear optics, they rely on this relatively weak nonlinear polarization, and then they use bulk nonlinear crystals that span many wavelengths of light to slowly build up the effect of this uh, nonlinear polarization into a, a significant uh, um, um, sufficiently strong output beam at, let's say, some different frequency generation. So these nonlinear crystals are long. And when they are long and spend many wavelengths, you need to worry about the concept of so-called phase matching, where each layer of this crystal has to provide the output at, let's say, some frequency in phase with all the other layers. And that puts severe restrictions on, on the bandwidth at which a single crystal uh, can, can generate light. Uh, and limits you in, in many ways. So if you manage to convert light in thin sub films, you first of all don't need to worry about phase matching. Uh, uh, your, your phase matching, uh, should, you should only worry about the phase matching in the plane of the crystal, so only parallel components of the k-vectors, 
of the input and output must match. And this is basically satisfied automatically. This is equivalent to the angle of incident being equal to the angle of reflection. Of course, when you build meta surfaces, you also will be able to control the phases in principle of um, uh, nonlinearity at the individual subwavelengths level, and then you can steer the beam. You can probably add some additional functions. And there is a lot of interesting effects that you can create uh, using this component. But again, you're limited by the efficiency. So again, if you think about generation efficiency of, let's say, some frequency generation, the textbook expression is shown here, and you have the frequency of the output, you have the effective nonlinearity of the medium, and the product of two intensities. You can simplify this expression by, for example, assuming two frequencies are the same, and write an expression for what fraction of the input light is going to be converted to the nonlinear output. And then from this formula, again, you have this very simple expression by canceling some components of the order one and expressing intensities through the electric field strengths, which tells you that if D is the thickness of the nonlinear meta surface, then the efficiency for second harmonic generation is going to be simply the ratio of thickness to the wavelengths of light times this product. And again, similarly to the previous slide, you see that if D is of the order of lambda, if you are sub-wavelengths, then chi 2 times E has to be of the order of 1 in order for uh, the structure to be efficient. So you need this, this uh, value, and if you want to limit yourself to some practical levels of intensities, let's say kilowatts or maybe up to megawatt per square centimeter, you quickly realize that the sky effective has to be uh, uh, 10,000 to maybe 100,000 times larger than that available by nature. So the question is, can, can, if you can build this nonlinear crystals, which would be, which would have orders of magnitude higher nonlinearity. And the approach to do this that, that we pursue is uh, uh, using meta surfaces. So meta surfaces uh, in the past have already been used to to uh, create uh, nonlinear optical elements. Uh, the way meta surfaces operate is that you take, at least the, the ones in the past, the, you take an existing nonlinear crystal, for example, gallium arsenide is one example of a nonlinear crystal, and then you pattern it in some sort of uh, nanoresonators, resonators that are smaller in, in size compared to the wavelengths. And then you have, here you have essentially mu resonators with high dielectric material being gallium arsenide right here at the center, surrounded by low index dielectrics on top and below. Then this resonator is shaped so that it has resonances at the input and the output, and that uh, it leads to an efficient light coupling from the input into the nonlinear crystal and then the out coupling of the generated nonlinear response into free space. Um, here they use the nature given materials. Gallium arsenide is one of the highest nonlinear material available in nature. And with this method, they, they're able to produce second harmonic generation, for example, from sub wavelengths films. Here the height is only of the order of a few hundred nanometers. But they still require very high intensities and have very low second harmonic output. So our innovation was to quantum engineer the material itself that goes inside of the resonators and then benefit from uh, our ability to basically maximize uh, the nonlinear response by intelligent design. We need a platform to do that. And our platform is inter sub -band transitions in uh, semiconductor heterostructures. So when you think of semiconductors, you typically think of a conduction and valence bands. There are electrons in the conduction band, there are holes in the valence band. But what you can, and, and light emission and all the transitions are determined by the band gap. At least that's, that's the typical thinking of, uh, of uh, semiconductor optoelectronics. But what you can also do is that you can grow layers of semiconductor on top of one another. And some of these layers could have a large band gap, and some of the other layers could have small band gap. And you can grow these layers with extreme precision uh, down to a few angstroms, actually, in, uh, in, in thickness, essentially monolayer by monolayer. And by controlling the thicknesses of these uh, materials, you can confine electrons in quantum wells. So now you can forget about holes. This semiconductor material is end doped That means that the valence band is completely filled, and you can forget about it. And the conduction band has some electrons. Electrons will occupy states that are confined inside of these quantum wells. And by playing with the thicknesses of these quantum wells, 
and quantum barriers, you can build the wave functions for the electrons in this semiconductor heterostructure. And you can artificially design this uh, energy level configuration in, in the wide range of, uh, for wide range of applications. The quantum cascade lasers that, that we mentioned uh, uh, are built using this technique, but you could do much more than quantum cascade lasers. You can control energy levels, positions, transition dipole moments, electron lifetime by playing with the thicknesses of wells and barriers. And these materials can be pretty heavily doped. Of course, electrons uh, are fermions, and you cannot really occupy the same state with more than two electrons, but luckily, electrons are free to move in the plane of the semiconductors. So for this ground state that corresponds to electron quantization in the z direction, you have actually many states of electrons that have different in-plane momenta k parallel. And so you can put a lot of electrons into that state, and they will all have different in-plane momenta, but since the transitions, optical transitions, are all vertical in the k-space, the momentum of electrons is going to be preserved as electron transitions from this state to that state, and all the effective masses for all the states are roughly the same, then these transitions all occur from this parabola to that parabola at the same energy. So you have atomic light joint density of states, which means that you can dope your structure heavily, and all these electrons will essentially transition at the same energy. Uh, you can tailor then this structure to have uh, desired linear and nonlinear optical properties. And what's important, you can implement what you design with a very high precision using the existing um, growth techniques that were developed for semiconductor lasers. So the technology to implement this is all available. These transitions are all polarized in the z direction, as you may imagine, because the layers are going in the z direction, which means that the electric field has to be normal to the surface of your structure, which makes it a bit difficult to couple light at, let's say, normal incidence, and we need to do some tricks. So now, now that you can engineer this, uh, this uh, electron wave functions, you can come back to the textbook formula for optical nonlinearities that come uh, in all the optics, uh, in all the nonlinear optics textbooks, and this is basically derived from uh, applied perturbation theory to, to Schrodinger equation, and that that all nonlinear textbooks give these expressions, but, but very few make use of these expressions because these expressions are to explain what you are what you're seeing in nonlinear materials. And there is, yes, you can use some density functional theory to predict how the new crystal, how much nonlinearity the new crystal would have, and, 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 and you know, use these uh, formulas to explain it. But really, you have little degree of engineering. With intersubband transitions, we could really look at this expression and really then design these quantum states. We can play with the, th with the thicknesses of these wells and barriers, and we have simulation tools that can simulate the wave functions. And we can play with these simulations to maximize the, trans the product of three transition dipole moments between the three states, let's say one, two, three, so that to maximize the particular nonlinear response for a particular process. We further can tune the resonances to again match the desired nonlinear process and further maximize it by the resonant enhancement. And then we could use the existing technology to implement everything that we are designing, and we could really see how, how it functions. Um, so this is an example, for example, of, of uh, the design of quantum wells for, for second harmonic generation. And this is a structure that would have strong nonlinear response at different frequency generation. And with this alone, we can already boost the nonlinearity by maybe 10,000 times compared to that of traditional nonlinear crystals. But we can go further. We could then place these quantum wells inside of the nanoresonators and further boost the nonlinear response by playing with the electromagnetic properties of our metasurface. So this is something that people have done in the past with other metasurfaces uh, using uh, bulk uh, existing nonlinear materials. Now we could use our nonlinear materials and squeeze them in and really produce record high uh, nonlinear response. So here the idea is the following. You, you design these quantum wells uh, using semiconductor growth. So going here, you design these layers, you get a wafer, you get these layers grown. Then you put some metal on top of this wafer, you do wafer bonding, and then you remove the substrate, leaving behind only this semiconductor material, 
And then you can put little gold pattern on top of that thin layer of semiconductor material and maybe edge antennas so that you get this structure where you have gold at the bottom, gold on top, and these are all your quantum wells. And these quantum wells are already designed to have this giant nonlinear response for electric field polarized perpendicular to the layers. Now when you have an input field, at, so this is your quantum wells, and there are maybe a lot of them, you can repeat them many times to stack, stack it all up. Then you have an input at frequency omega, and this input polarization couples to antenna resonance in this direction. So current starts running inside of this antenna, physical current, it's, it's a metal antenna, and this current produces oscillating electric field in the material, now it oscillates up and down. Nonlinear polarization, this is electric field at frequency omega, and you have strong nonlinear response. So this oscillating electric field produces uh, oscillating polarization that has some component at second harmonic generation, given by the product of the square of this electric field times the nonlinear susceptibility. Now this oscillating second harmonic generation uh, polarization can excite another antenna resonance from within, and that means that the current is going to be flowing in this antenna roughly in this direction, at least that's how these T-shaped antennas are designed, and then this antenna will then re-radiate the second harmonic generation into free space. So that's how it's happening in, uh, kind of, uh, in the microscopic scale. And if you want to analyze this, then you can treat this entire metasurface as some optical medium. After all, these resonators are smaller than wavelengths, and so they are patterned uh, in, in some periodic uh, manner, with the period smaller than the wavelengths, and then you can treat this whole area as, as, a, as, as a metamaterial. Uh, uh, with the effective nonlinearity that is given by the value of the quantum nonlinearity of the, of the quantum wells, it's in z-direction, and this is something that you design by uh, playing with the thicknesses of wells and barriers, multiplied by this so-called overlap integral. We called it the overlap integral, which is basically the product of the field enhancements uh, that you get in the antenna for the incident radiation and squared and for the second harmonic radiation or for whatever output frequency you have. So you have to multiply these two terms together and integrate them over the entire antenna volume. And then the trick is to design antenna that maximize this overlap integral and make it as large as possible. So when we did the first demonstration uh, in 2014, we, we had antennas that were designed like this. They were sitting on top of multi-quantum wells. And these are some of the, um, uh, what, what is plotted is the strength of the electric field produced by excitation in this direction, uh, about 100 nanometers below the top antenna. So you can see that this antenna was designed so that at fundamental frequency, which in this case was uh, at 10 microns, the, there was a some field enhancement at the ends of the antenna. And the second harmonic generation with this polarization, there was this field enhancement on that antenna. And this is the cross section of the field along these dashed lines. So that's basically, you get an idea how field is enhanced. And then the overlap integral, for example, here in this original demonstration was actually just half. So it was actually, the effective nonlinearity was smaller than the original nonlinearity of chi 2 but it allows us to at least convert polarizations. We could now shine light at normal incidence. And in the future, we, of course, improved the resonator design. So these are more improved ones with the T-shape, and now we etch the semiconductor heterostructure. Now you can see much stronger field enhancement and much more uniform distribution of the electric field at omega and 2 omega. And now this overlap integral is about 4. So how well does this, this thing work? And uh, so we have this uh, uh, d demonstration uh, where um, um, uh, we, we build this quantum well, uh, we can design all this inter sub transition, supply doping, and uh, plot the nonlinear response function. Uh, and we already have 300 nanometers per volt or 300,000 picometers per volt, which is already a factor of 10,000 higher than that of typical nonlinear crystals. This is how nonlinearity is going to look like for this uh, uh, configuration. And uh, we operate in, in mid infrared spectral range. So our input at, is roughly at 10 microns, and second harmonic is at 4 microns. We are limited somewhat by this 
conduction band offset. We cannot really go to visible easily in our heterostructures because our semiconductors have only so much of uh, uh, band offset between conduction bands of uh, well material and the barrier material. But nevertheless, this is, these are the calculations, and when we implemented it into, we, we, could, we could probe uh, optical transitions in this heterostructure by using spectroscopy at, uh, in this configuration. We confirm that these states are where we design them to be, and then we process it in the metasurface with antennas. We could probe the resonances of the antennas for X polarized light. It's this long resonance at long wavelengths, and for the short polarized, uh, for the output, Frequency, it's another resonance, it's along Y direction. So the resonances are in the right place for the input and output. And then we could use a, a semiconductor laser, uh, which is a quantum cascade laser that is similar in operation to this uh, laser pointer in my, uh, this red laser pointer. Uh, it has actually similar amounts of powers. We only have, well, this laser pointer is probably something like five milliwatts, uh, and QCL is 50 milliwatts. Here. So we really have a continuous wave intensity comparable to this laser pointer and deeply nonlinear metasurface, which was uh, lambda over 20 in thickness. So the question is, how much second harmonic radiation would such a small amount of power produce in such a thin layer of structure? Of course, we focused our beam side, so we, we measured the beam waste and did all the calculations, and these are the results. So, Despite being extremely deeply sub-wavelengths, and despite using the tiny amounts of powers, which is only, so here is intensity squared, which corresponds to 10 kilowatt per square centimeter, or for the power squared, we are roughly at, so here we are 100 milliwatts squared, that's not 50 milliwatts, 100 milliwatts squared, we already are able to produce nearly 100 microwatts of second harmonic generation, which means that our conversion efficiency is already 0.1%, and this is a huge number for such such a thin structure, which was only 400 nanometers in thickness, and such low input intensities. And this is how the conversion efficiency changes as we increase the laser power. So you can see immediately here that we have a little bit of troubles. You know, yes, nonlinearity is huge, so for low intensities, everything looks great. We have incredible slope of, uh, you know, 17 milliwatts of second harmonic generation per watt squared, but at high intensities, we move a bit into the saturation. And that's right now is the problem that, that, that limits us. And we can understand why this is uh, happening. This is happening because we saturate this transition from one to two because we are sufficiently close. Uh, this, this one to two transition, transition from this ground state to the first excited state is, is close to the pump frequency. We purposely made it close so that we can enhance the nonlinear response. And then we slightly detuned it to, to a certain degree, um, uh, reduce the saturation effects, but nevertheless, saturation effects are there. And as we saturate, we transfer electron population from the ground state to the first excited state, and nonlinearity, if you plot the populations in the ground state, first excited state, second excited state, has this dependence on the electron population. And as we start populating the second excited state, you can see that our nonlinearity will be significantly reduced. One can also calculate the saturation intensity in this quantum wells, and you get something like one and a half megawatt per square centimeter intensity. That's the intensity inside of the multi-quantum wells. And since we have about 10 times field enhancement, that is, we have 10 times stronger field in this non-resonator compared to the electric field in the impinging light, the one and a half megawatt per square centimeter intensity in the quantum wells is achieved at only 15 kilowatt per square centimeter of the input. And that's roughly where we observe this, uh, the saturation effect. So um, in order to, um, uh, you know, uh, analyze this uh, effect and whether, whether our understanding matches it, we basically, uh, we, 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 we basically can, can plot the expression for chi2 as a function of uh, populations and plot the expression for saturation intensities. And then we realize that we are limited by this product, chi ZZZ times intensity saturation. And we have, we have some, some room to play with it. For example, if the line width of our intersubband transitions is significantly reduced, then even the small detuning will already lead to significant decrease of uh, saturation uh, effects in our structure. But, but this line width is right now limited by the, by the growth quality of our materials. And we are working to improve it, but, but right now 
this this point one uh, percent conversion efficiency is, is is our limit, and we could use this saturation. Uh, effect to, to perform simulations. We could, we could model our structure and see how the saturation affects our performance. And these are the results of the modeling. You can see that different nanoresonators uh, play a role on the maximum conversion efficiency. Gamma shaped that I showed you in our original publication gives you very low conversion efficiency. And then T shaped with etching and non-etching gives you progressively higher and higher conversion efficiency. So resonators matter. And our best resonator right now is this T shaped that gives us experimentally about 0.8% conversion efficiency. And theoretically, in this model, it was actually even a bit lower than what we experimentally observed, but order of magnitude roughly there. The same model predicts that if we manage to improve our growth quality, which reduces the line widths of this inter transitions, ideally, fundamentally, the line width is really limited by only a few millielectron volts, by phonon scattering and other fundamental materials. The, the, the 30 millielectron volts that we have in our actual structures is really the growth quality. And, and potentially it can be improved. So even the smallest improvement here already could lead to significant enhancement of the conversion efficiency before the saturation. Move into a few percent. And that means that the spatial surfaces potentially could be practical nonlinear optical element that would allow convert media frequencies from one to another. Okay, so it took me a bit uh, longer time than than I thought, but let me let me talk briefly uh, about a couple of tricks that uh, that we could do with these beta surfaces. Now we have a flat nonlinear optical element, so we could do things that otherwise would be difficult with linear optical elements. For example, one of the tricks that we could do is we can continuously vary the phase of our nonlinear antenna, the response of our nonlinear antennas, and essentially shape the output beam. Our input is a plane wave at normal incidence. But our output depends on the local phases of these resonators. When they're all the same, output is also going backwards normally to the surface. If they're different, we could produce a spiral beam. We could direct them left and right. And this is possible with the metal surface because we come top down. Everything is, is by design. So one trick that you can do is to, well, one trick to introduce different phases in the local nanoresonator response is a known concept in, in meta surfaces. It's called geometric phase. If you send a circularly polarized light and you have an antenna, an antenna will also generate circularly polarized light in the output. The rotation of the antenna amounts to a phase shift in the response. Now, it's easy to understand conceptually. Uh, basically, if you think about this antenna and you think about the input light, which is circularly polarized, at any given moment in time, the electric field in the circularly polarized light is in a particular direction. And that particular direction of the electric field corresponds to a particular distribution of, key, of uh, currents in that antenna. Now, if I rotate this antenna, the distribution of the currents in the rotated antenna is going to be exactly the same as the distribution of currents in the original antenna, but just half a cycle or quarter of a cycle later, because the antenna will have exactly the same orientation with the electric field in the circularly polarized light just a little later. Circularly polarized light keep rotating, and then the rotation of the antenna really amounts to the phase shift in the antenna response. So then you can uh, do, you can also do it mathematically, but this conceptual uh, thinking is, is the easiest. This antenna will interact with circular polarized light and exactly the same as that antenna will interact with circular polarized light uh, a, a moment later. Uh, and then you basically see that if you operate on a circular polarization basis, your input is right circular polarized, your output is left or right circular polarized light, then the rotation of this antenna really amounts to introduction of phase shift in the nonlinear response. And then you can make this array where these antennas have some slow rotation, and then you shine right circular polarized light, for example, at a normal incidence, and left circular polarized light will be steered in only one direction because these uh, antennas will have a constant gradient of the nonlinear response. For uh, left circular for right circle for left circular polarized light input and left circular polarized output, a unit of rotation corresponds to three times change in the phase. And for the right circular polarized output and left circular polarized input, 
this rotation corresponds to once change of the phase. This is to do, uh, this follows from some mathematical considerations. But basically, both this and that will have a phase gradient. Now we can fabricate this and test if this phase gradient holds true. And indeed, of course, as expected, we, we could see that our second harmonic uh, beam for the right circular polarized input and right circular polarized output is tuned in a particular angle uh, according to the phase gradient that is introduced in the meta surface. This is just the simplest demonstration of how phase gradient can be used to control the beam. Uh, you could also, of course, think of uh, uh, other configurations where you, um, for example, uh, produce uh, um, add orbital angular momentum, produce Bessel beams, and all the other exotic beams by controlling the local phases of the nonlinear response. You could also use voltage tuning to achieve the same effect. After all, you apply bias to your quantum wells and energy levels shift. Energy levels shift, your uh, quantum mechanical expression for the nonlinearity starts changing, and you basically as you change the resonant denominators, the phase of the complex nonlinear response changes, and that corresponds to the change in the phase of the response of the antennas. So again, this is an implementation where this quantum wells uh, can now be biased, and when you apply certain bias voltage, they shift in a certain way, and you can predict how the value of the optical nonlinearity changes. Value will change as well, because you're moving in and out of resonance, but also the phase will change. And so you, this is how energy levels of these different states change, and these are the results of simulations to predict how the amplitude and the phase of the nonlinear response will change. And now we can fabricate these meta surfaces. And to, uh, now antennas are a bit different; they are all connected because we want to bias this entire structure. So everything has to be continuous, uh, covered by some continuum of gold. So the antenna design is. Slightly different, but the idea is similar. You have some local field enhancement, and you compute the overlap integral. And now you can bias your structure with voltage, and you can predict how the chi 2 will change as a function of wavelength. So at zero volts, you expect chi ZZZ of your meta surface to uh, have this dependence. And at uh, some higher bias voltage, the maximum is going to be there. So if you stay at 9.5 microns, you essentially modulate your nonlinear response from zero to, to maximum. No, no nonlinearity, maximum nonlinearity, but just applying voltage. And phase also changes accordingly. So it's not a big phase change, but nevertheless, it changes, let's say, at 9.5 microns by applying different bias voltage. You can change the phase of the response from minus 100 degrees to, to zero. And you could use it to really demonstrate that you can switch nonlinearity on and off. This is experimental results. Laser was tuned and second harmonic intensity was measured. And you can see that at different voltage, second harmonic response has different values. You could move to 9.5 microns, and then you can modulate the second harmonic response from zero to maximum. Oh, this, is the, yeah, this is the second harmonic detector signal, and this is the modulation voltage. So you can vary the nonlinearity of your crystal. You could also do tricks by biasing the structure continuously and then introduce the continuous variation of the phase of the nonlinear response. And here you have these antennas, and here's one bias voltage, here's, the, 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 here's another bias voltage, and then the structure is repeated many times to the side. So when the bias voltage is the same, you have a uniform structure. Angle of incidence of your pump, which is normal, uh, produces the normal output of second harmonic generation. You apply bias selectively to the structures, and then you introduce variation in chi 2. Essentially, you create a grating. And then the output, you start seeing the diffraction orders, because now chi 2 is non-uniform across the structure. If you try this structure, where you put zero bias here and positive bias there, you continuously vary the voltage across these surfaces, because the current basically goes from this contact to that contact, and the voltage continuously varies. In that case, you apply bias voltage, and you see that at zero bias, you had response of second harmonic at normal incidence, at uh, uh, bias where this is zero and this is some positive value, you have some component of second harmonic generation steer to the left, you reverse the bias, 
this same component of second harmonic generation now steers to the right. So you introduce a continuous phase variation. OK, so uh, yeah, 10 minutes left. Uh, so, so OK, so then where, where would this, uh, so you know, we, we, we played some of the tricks. And um, uh, the question is, you know, where, where, where would the current, where would this meta surfaces in their current status be useful? Uh, um, so first of all, you know, even in mid infrared spectral range, uh, we, we believe that there is significant degree of improvement that is possible by improving the growth quality and limiting the inter and transition line widths. If we manage to narrow inter and transitions line widths from the current, you know, SURI MEV full width half maximum to something like 10 MEV, which, is, which should be possible, we, 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 we could improve the conversion efficiency to some practical values, which, for example, could be used for autocorrelation measurements uh, when you measure the mid-IR pulse lengths, for example, or maybe just to convert some of the frequencies from uh, of, of semiconductor lasers, such as quantum cascade lasers, from the region uh, you know, where they perform well to the region where they perform not so well. And one example uh, is to move uh, continuous wave uh, sources from shorter wavelengths, where there are semiconductor lasers that can operate continuous wave, to regions where there are not so many semiconductor lasers that operate continuous wave. Now, you have to realize that when we talk about, for example, systems uh, based on XPLA, XMA light conversion, these are pulse laser systems. They, they have a broad spectral tuning range, but they have a pretty broad line widths. And many applications, particularly gas sensing applications, high resolution spectroscopy applications, they require narrow line widths, continuous wave lasers. And this usually are low power sources uh, that, uh, that, that I actually built these days around uh, semiconductor laser technology, quantum cascade lasers. And if you extend the spectral bandwidths of the sources, uh, this is a great benefit to, to people that are doing high resolution spectroscopy, gas sensing, etc. So here we did the demonstration where we could generate uh, difference frequency generation. We have two lasers, 5.4 and 1.3, and a similar type of quantum well uh, design optimized for this difference frequency mixing. Antennas, again, similar concept, still two shapes. We, we could not, despite trying several different shapes that were original promising, originally promising T shapes still gives us the best results. So here are the two resonances of this T-shaped antennas. This is for the input lambda one, this is for another input lambda two, and this is for the output lambda three. They're not exactly well matched because you, you always have some fabrication errors, but they're well enough matched. And we could generate different frequency generation here um, with the conversion efficiency of 0.3%. So 0.3% of the input photons at 5.4 microns are converted to the uh, 12 micron radiation. And uh, this is the dependence of the difference frequency generation uh, versus pump one, which was the 5.4 uh, micron uh, power. And this is the dependence of the difference frequency generation pump two. So we actually see very little saturation and we have basically linear dependence of the output on the input. And this is the spectral dependence. We could tune uh, the input and we get different frequency generation across the entire spectral range, but some wavelengths work better than others. And these are the wavelengths for which the antennas and the quantable systems are resonantly enhanced. Uh, so we also uh, have some uh, plans to use these meta surfaces for different frequency generation in the terahertz spectral range. We have nice sources uh, which are photomixers for, for different for terahertz uh, spectral range but photomixers stop operating at wavelengths of at, at terahertz frequencies so roughly three terahertz so they work well for one two terahertz but at three terahertz their performance decreases uh, in case of our meta surfaces because of a different um, generation mechanism based on nonlinear polarization they perform best at high terahertz frequencies and here's some simulations results and antennas where we could uh, again use similar concepts and uh, generate a response at roughly six terahertz by exciting antennas with two mid infrared quantum cascade lasers at nine and ten microns these are the resonances and producing difference frequency which are resonant with this antenna mode at 
55 microns. The work is actually on this ongoing, and uh, theoretical simulations indicate that we should be able to generate hundreds of microwatts, maybe up to a milliwatt of terahertz radiation using less than one watt of input powers, which is well within the capability of uh, semiconductor and laser technology. Because I'm out of time, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll move to, to actually the conclusion. I wanted to also talk about third order nonlinear effects, but, but I guess I, I have, to, have to skip. So let me see how I can do this. Uh -huh. Sorry. And I'll move to the conclusion. Um, so uh, what, what I have shown you is that by combining the concepts of, of meta surfaces to the full, fullest, where we use both electromagnetic design of the local nano resonators and the quantum mechanical engineering of the material itself, you can produce meta surfaces that really show giant nonlinear optical response, which now represents really the highest, to, to, to the best of our knowledge, the highest material with the highest nonlinearity in the middle of red spectral range out of everything is available. Uh, the measured values of nonlinear response are 1 million picometers per volt. This is to be compared, for example, with typical values of nonlinear crystals of only 10 picometers per volt. So we are 100,000 times higher than that. And in the expressions for the nonlinear frequency conversion, this term chi2 comes squared. So we benefit a lot. This allows us to produce significant amounts of second harmonic generation in deeply sub wavelength films using light intensities that are comparable to the light intensity of this laser pointer. We, because we build meta surfaces, we can control the phase, local phase of the nonlinear response at the individual nano resonator level and create these exotic uh, beams by, uh, well, we did not really make an exotic beam, we just demonstrated the beam, beam steering, but, but in principle, this could also be used to create more exotic beams, such as, for example, Bessel beam or um, or or, uh, or uh, other beams with different orbital angular momentum. Uh, we also can extend this idea, and I, unfortunately I didn't have time to, to, to talk about this, to other nonlinearities, including third order nonlinearities, and there we also observe very high nonlinear response, again, many orders of magnitude larger than anything observed in, in the comparable uh, uh, solid state material systems. Uh, we believe that this, this approach has promising uh, future for up and in particular down conversion to longer wavelengths, uh, intensity dependent beam steering, uh, all optical computations or all optical control, saturable absorber mirrors and other applications. So in conclusion, I'll just acknowledge the students in my group that uh, contributed to the work that, to the development of the meta surfaces that I talked about and our collaborators in, uh, in various places that also contributed to this work, and finally the funding. Thank you. Thanks, Mikhail, for a nice talk, uh, and uh, this is the uh, time for your question. So, very nice and... Uh, interesting overview of the old nonlinear effect and meta surfaces. So I would like to ask you first the epsilon zero materials, for example, n equal to zero, and this uh, what Boyd, for example, claimed nonlinear optic for single photons. Please comment on this direction. Right. <laughs> so this, this is, um, uh, so when we, uh, there is a part of, uh, so, so when, when Boyd talks about epsilon near zero material, he focuses on the chi, chi three, response. So these are chi-3 materials. We also did chi-3 work. I had to skip it. I apologize. I miscalculated my time quite a bit. But in any case, so this is a little table that shows where we stand compared to epsilon near zero materials. This is Boyd's work, number two. This is his work. So uh, the chi-3 that we can produce using our inter transitions, what gives us, this, this was uh, this, the, the, the operational regime that we had this meta surface uh, operating at was uh, a power limiter. 
So we increase the imaginary part of, of, of um, our refractive index, so to speak. And the value of this imaginary part of chi 3 that leads to that increased imaginary part of the refractive index is 10 to minus 12 meters squared per wall squared. And this is to compare to void of 10 to minus 15. So we are still we are three orders of magnitude higher. So and in terms of the speed of the response, because we, when you talk about chi 3 materials, the speed of the response also matters. Well, his response time is a half a picosecond. We use pump probe measurements to measure our response time. It was two picoseconds. So we are a bit slower, but comparable overall, and have three orders of magnitude higher than linearity. OK, and then um, one more question. In principle, if you would like to increase second order harmonic, so you have three possibilities. So resonant enhancement of the fundamental field, resonant enhancement of the second harmonic, and of course, this engineering of uh, heat to um, how you do it with the energy levels, et cetera, et cetera. So this is three possibility. And what is the best way or how to combine everything together? Right, so I don't have, I don't have a clear answer to this question. We're still searching. So uh, I, I, I can't give, give this answer. I, I believe that we have not explored the entire design space. We are also limited by the materials properties. So all I can say is that we should keep exploring because even if we assume that we improve our materials a little bit, we already expect to produce a significant improvement in the performance of these structures. Um, you could also think of, for example, various kinds of dielectric resonators that do not use metal. There is some difficulty there because metal allows us to easily convert the polarizations from being in plane to being out of plane. And for inter transitions, this is very important. We tried different dielectric resonators, but we were never able to build as high nonlinear overlap integral as we, as we built with the metal antenna. So right now, it's the state of the art, but I think the story is not, is not over yet. So yes, yes, we played, but it was not as, as highly enhanced as, as, as with metal. OK, good. Good afternoon. Uh, impressive presentation. And uh, my curiosity goes to uh, two questions. So in the fourth slide, can you maybe, um, yes. which method uh, allows to you to create such, uh, such precise materials and how it was created in the fourth slide? Right. Mm -hmm. You, you mean this, right? This or that? Uh, four, like uh, one behind. Yeah, like this one. This one? Yeah. Uh, well, so this is an example. This is not our work, our work, right? But we build similar nanoresonators. And the way you do it is using electron beam lithography. So you use electron beam lithography to pattern a hard mask, silicon nitrate, and then use silicon nitrate to etch this, uh, the structures. Mm, understood. And 18th, it's like 18th, how much, uh, how fast it must be spent, and what's the delay of the magnetic field of the response of the material which is detected? Right, so, so again, to, to, to explain how this resonators work, we are using the concept of so-called geometric phase. This is a concept known in, uh, in linear optics. And this is how this, this flat lenses, uh, some of the flat lenses are designed. When you shine a circular, circular polarized light and you have a resonator that has a certain shape, there are currents of polarization distribution that is induced inside of that resonator by this circular polarized light. Electric field in a circular polarized light keeps rotating. So you will have exactly, so this resonator will have a certain field distribution for this electric field polarization. This resonator will have the same electric field distribution, but for this electric field polarization. So this res resonator will generate the same response as this one, but a moment later. It will wait until this field is rotated there and produce the same response. And then the second harmonic output is a similar effect. So by rotating these resonators, we delay the second harmonic phase, so this guy emits second harmonic, this guy emits second harmonic with a phase delay. 
this guy emits second harmonic with additional phase delay. And, and fixed about times, uh, how, how much is the delay? How? How much is the delay, like uh, in... in the, the delay is dependent on the angle of rotation. So the phase delay, if you have right circular polarized input and right circular polarized output, one, let's say, one degree of rotation will lead to three degrees phase delay. If you have right circular polarized input and left circular polarized output, one degree of rotation will lead to one degree of phase delay. So three times the angle or one time the angle. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, very nice talk. Thank you very much. So I, want, I was kind of wondering, so this uh, huge increase in Chi 2, right? So, uh, and, and I sort of saw that, uh, so, so we have those uh, sort of evenly spaced energy layers and also similar uh, electron effective mass there, but uh, what's, could you somehow reiterate what is the main reason behind this? So, sort of like, like very high dipole moments, transition dipoles, so what, what is the main yeah, thing? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, let me just go here. Um, I don't know, maybe here. Okay. So f first of all, in the meta surface, we have two effects, right? One is quantum engineering. One is electromagnetic engineering. Electromagnetic engineering is about field enhancement and antennas. Quantum engineering is about uh, wave functions. So here, we benefit from several factors. One is that we can significantly distort the, um, uh, well, introduce significant asymmetry in our uh, potential energy profile. In traditional, bulk, in traditional crystals, you, you must have atoms uh, arranged in a certain symmetry groups in order to produce significant chi 2 effect. But again, you are limited by what nature gives you. Here, by playing with the swells and barriers, we can severely distort the, the uh, potential in which these electrons oscillate. That's one effect. Second effect is the effective mass of electrons in semiconductors is significantly smaller than the free, if free electron mass. So in this material system, indium gallium arsenide, aluminum indium arsenide that we used, the effective mass of the electron in the well is 0 .4, 0 0.04. And you, you know that oscillator strikes, for example, has one over mass in, in the denominator, which means that for a given transition energy, our dipole moments are going to be square root of one over effective mass stronger. So one over square root of 0 0.04 is about five times stronger for a given energy. And we have three of those. So that's another reason why you boost. And finally, of course, you move close to residence, although being too close to residence is also bad. And that's a third, third effect that leads to this giant response. I see. Thank you. Thank you. So just uh, two short questions. One is uh, just uh, to confirm the data that you showed on the uh, results, experimental results on these uh, metasurfaces, is that uh, relevant for uh, room temperature ambient? Uh, yes, temperature? everything is at down Everything at room is room temperature. temperature. So you're talking about uh, the growth improvements that also relates to room temperature performance. Room temperature, yes. Okay. Uh, and second question is, do you see an opportunity for this type of metasurfaces to be integrated in your, let's say, mid-air photonics work, where you could, you know, really do everything on chip, let's say? Uh, right. Uh, so, it, as, as you know, Augustus, we already integrate some of these nonlinear elements in quantum cascade lasers inside of the waveguide to produce some of the difference frequency response. Not exactly this kind, yes, yes. but in this same spirit. We, 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 we use these quantum wells to design both a laser and a nonlinear optical element in one. Now, I exactly this type of systems, yes, we, we now work on mid infrared photonic integration, where we integrate quantum cascade lasers, passive waveguides, and different materials on the same wafer. The, 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 this, the, this photonic integration offers numerous opportunities, and one of them is to integrate, for example, lasers and modulators based on these inter sub -band transitions for free space communications, for example. Yes, this is, this is one possible route. 
to move forward to. Thank you. Okay, one short question from auditorium. Uh, okay. Very interesting talk and nice work. Uh, you mentioned, uh, and it's here on your slide, difference frequency generation potentially for terahertz. Uh, could you briefly describe the pros and cons of using that method versus directly generating the power with QCLs? Right. Um, so, um, terahertz quantum cascade lasers um, don't operate at room temperature, as you know. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, there has been significant uh, amount of improvement in th their temperature operation, but still, if you think of a continuous wave source of terahertz radiation, terahertz quantum cascade lasers cannot provide such at the moment. Even pulsed operation is limited, uh, requires some cooling, and CW is always lower than pulsed. Um, uh, mid infrared quantum cascade lasers work at room temperature and they are commercially available. So, if you take two mid infrared quantum cascade lasers, which are small chips, put a little beam splitter to combine the, the beams and uh, add a meta surface, uh, then you will have a terahertz source. How much power? The question is always how much power you can generate. So, we believe that you can, you can generate if you, if you take, let's say, uh, two one watt. So it's a pretty high power, but these are st still available. Emid are QCLs. You should be able to generate up to one milliwatt, at least theoretically, of difference frequency generation. This, uh, these are continuous wave lasers, so your output has the nice uh, line width properties. Uh, it could also be broadly tunable, because a small tuning of a mid infrared chip, which could be obtained by temperature tuning, is actually a lot in the terahertz domain. So if you fix one of the wavelengths of our mid-IR laser and heat up the other laser, it will redshift. That means that difference frequency is reduced. Then we can keep this laser as cold, well, as, at the same temperature as it is, and temperature tune the other one. It will go the other way, and our difference frequency tunes to the blue. Now, QCLs can be temperature tuned in mid-IR by, let's say, three, five wave numbers. You add three, five to three, so five wave numbers to five wave numbers, 10 wave numbers. 10 wave numbers is 300 gigahertz. So you can build a broadly tunable source in this, in this way. Now, there are photomixers, of course. Photomixers uh, have high efficiency, but they work, they, 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 the operation is based on generating current. Current. They, 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 you really change the conductivity of your material. And whenever you deal with current, you're limited by resistance capacitance. So, so, and also time of flight. So all of these photomixers, they stop operating well at high terahertz frequencies. They work well and produce high powers at one terahertz, two terahertz, but you go to three, four, and the power there drops uh, dramatically. Really, uh, I think it drops as square of the one or square of the frequency or something like that. It drops pretty, pretty fast. Now, our metasurfaces generate light using polarization response, the P term in Maxwell's equations. And there, uh, just like going from electronics to photonics, we know that uh, we are not limited by the resistance capacitance because we generate polarization from within the, the, from within the material itself. And so our structures are expected to have the highest performance at high terahertz frequencies. So I think this metasurface approach is very, very complementary to the um, uh, photomixers approach. Okay, thank you for auditorium for a very interesting question and thank you for Mikhail for a nice talk and uh, fruitful answers. Thank you.